God's desire for your life is that you would make His Word your standard of living. The basis of all truth is God's Holy Word. We invite you to join the Beulah Baptist Church in Bennett, North Carolina for Truth For Today with Dr. Neil Jackson. Dr. Jackson's verse-by-verse preaching will encourage you in your journey of life and answer your greatest questions from God's Word. So open your Bible and your heart to hear truth for today. I was a senior in high school. We were in a basketball tournament. Um, it, 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 it was a, wasn't, we weren't hosting it. Someone else, another school was hosting it. Well, we won the first game and it came time for the second game. And, and we came out and we as the players hadn't scouted the team, so we didn't know who they were. And they were huge. They were gigantic. So we go out and we're doing our little layups and we're doing our little warm-up exercises and everything, but they were huge. And we had lost the momentum just by seeing them because, I mean, their smallest guy was bigger than, than our biggest guy. And they were just gigantic and they were bowed up and they were just coming in and you knew they could duck everywhere and they would just come right up and just... We, 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 were, we were intimidated. Our basketball coach pulled us aside. He got us on the side of the court. He said, no, 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 let's go back in the locker room. He took us back into the locker room. He says, boys, let's just forfeit right now. And a couple of us were ready to give motions. I make a motion. I second it. We were ready to make the motions. He says, if you are going to be intimidated by their size, we don't have a prayer. But if you'll go out there, I'm telling you, if you'll go out there and if you'll play our game, we'll run these boys out of the gym. We thought it was blowing smoke. We thought, oh, coach is so, he's so inspirational. Oh, yeah, whatever. But we did what he said. At the end of the game, we were more shocked at the end of the game than we were at the beginning of the game. And these guys were too. We beat them by 25 points. And they were huge. They, 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 they should have run us out of the gym. But we played our game. And we won. We come here to 1 Samuel 17. And you see a bunch of Israelite soldiers who are intimidated, who are fearful. Oh no, that giant is so big. He's going to school us. He's going to feed us to the dogs. He's going to eat us as chump change. And there's one. There's one red-headed teenager who says, you know what, boys? If we play his game, that giant is nothing. That giant is Wheaties. We'll eat him as champions. And that's what we see today. Five scenes in a story of an overcomer. Sermons entitled, Facing the Giants. Scene number one, the conflict. Notice verse 2 of 1 Samuel 17. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. So the chapter opens. The atmosphere is filled with hostility and hate and war. The Israelites are once again going against their arch enemy, the Philistines, in a place called the, and it's a significant place, the Valley of Elah. It's interesting. The Valley of Elah was 15 miles west of Bethlehem where David was born. And the Valley of Elah was about 15 miles from Gath where Goliath the giant was born. On one side of the valley stood the army of Israel. On the other side of the valley stood the army of of the Philistines, and if you ever get the opportunity to go see this valley, you need to do it. It's about a mile wide, and it's a perfect place to battle. In these days, 
countries did not have standing armies, if you will, ordinary citizens, they would go, they would fight using their own weapons, they would take, take their own food, and literally, in this time period, it was just a volunteer militia. That's what it was, the conflict. Uh, let's listen to this. The Philistines were the Israelites' nemesis. They were their antagonists. They were always in their face. They were always coming and trying to mess up their lives. I don't know what it is in your life, but I know it's something. You got that one little thing. Oh, it's just going to get in your face. It's going to trip you up, and it just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back. The conflict. Secondly, I want you to notice the champion. Look at verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So the Philistine army is led by this man by the name of Goliath. And he's called a champion. Well, it says that Goliath was six cubits and a span. You say, well, what is six cubits and a span? Well, a cubit is the distance from your elbow to the end of your, your index finger, 17 or 18 inches. A span is the distance between your thumb and your little finger, about 8 inches. So, Goliath, according to Ryrie, Charles Ryrie, was 9 foot 9 inches tall, he was a big old boy. Now, if you were to go and ask Matthew Henry, how tall was Goliath? Matthew Henry says he was almost 12 feet tall. I don't know how tall he was. I just know he was a big old boy, and he was a lot bigger than I was or anybody there. Look at verse 5. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. So not only was he a big dude, he was a bad dude. He had a brass helmet. He had a metal coat, listen to this, that weighed 200 pounds. When you saw him coming with this big old brass coat, you're thinking, that boy is big, and that boy is bad. You don't mess with that boy. His spear, his spear weighed 30 pounds. Don't you know that if he were to throw that at you, and it were to hit you and take you into the wall, you would just be stuck in a real sense. Goliath stands on one side of the valley and for 40 days he taunts these people. For 40 days he ridicules these people. For 40 days he challenges these people. And the children of Israel are saying, he's big and he's bad and he could whoop us. Friend, that's you. Some of you are looking at this big giant in your life and say, man, he's big. Man, he's bad. Man, I just don't have the strength to beat this giant in my life. And you are shaking in your boots just like the children of Israel are. But look at verse 8. He's taunting them. He stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set the battle in array? Am not night I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and I kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. Hold on a second. That was a total lie. You'll see at the end of the story, they didn't surrender. They still fought. A lot of times, Satan's people, they're just flat-out liars, and that was a lie. Verse 10, and the Philistine said, listen to this, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. 
Can you see him as he lifts those big old hands? I defy the armies of God this day. Hold on a second. He wasn't just defying the armies of God that day. He was defying God. God, you think you're bad. You think you're awesome. You do something about this. Hold on a second. That's what's going on in your life. Sin is just rampant and saying, no, 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 you can't beat pornography. No, no, you can't beat this relationship stuff. No, no, you can't beat this financial stuff. You and your God, you're nothing. And he's in your face just like Goliath is. The conflict. Number two, the champion. Number three, notice the cowards. Look at verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The living God is their protector. He's the captain of their army. And they're afraid. Boys, why are you so afraid? Why are you running scared? Why are you acting like chickens? You realize who the captain of your army is? You should not be afraid. And that's what I say to you. Some of you are running around. Oh, the world is falling. The world is falling. The world is falling. We just, we're just not going to make it. We're just not going to exist. We're going to be gone. And I say, hey, are you a Christian? Do you have a Savior? He is able to defeat your giant. Number four. Notice the challenger. Look at verse 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Now here's what's intriguing to me. Jesse had four other sons at home. He had eight, eight, eight sons total. There were five at home. Three of them that were going to the battle. Why did he send David? David was the youngest. David, a chapter previously, had just been anointed as the future king of Israel. Any slave could have done this. Why did he send David, the average teenager, which David would have been at this time, would have been, oh, Dad, do you realize they're going to make fun of me? Jesus, really? He would have been griping. He would have been complaining. Why does Jesse say, David, go do this. Look at verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him and came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. Why did he choose David? Because he knew David would respond immediately. And friend, don't think you're ever going to be used by God to defeat giants if you're not faithful in the little things, if you're not obeying God when he tells you something immediately, if you're not running, if you're complaining, I don't like this, that's fine. You're never going to be greatly used by God. You're never going to be used by God for these huge tasks. Think about it. David would have missed this task. He more than likely may have never got to be king. He definitely wouldn't have gotten to kill Goliath. He definitely wouldn't have had that victory to propel him to future. The little tasks are important. Teenager, the little tasks are important. Dad, reading your Bible is important. Your daily prayer time is, is important. Look, 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 here's the situation. Look at verse 24. And all the men of Israel... When they saw the man, they fled from him and were, you see how that word you know, is worded? And were sore afraid. They were scared to death. Oh no, we're going to 
die. Grown men, they're, they're shaking in their boots. We're going to die. We're going to die. Verse 26, David comes up, spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Do you realize that's what's happening in our day? Reproach. Reproach is coming on Christians because we're letting the devil, we're letting these giants overtake us. What shall be done to the person who takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is not us versus them. This is them versus him. And that's what it is in your life. Stop saying, well, I'm not big enough. I'm not bad enough. I can't take down that giant. It's not your battle. It's his battle. Get out of the way and let him fight and you join with him in the fight. Look at verse 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Saul was the king. He was the hero. Everyone looked up to Saul, and Saul looked at him and says, David! You're a kid. You're a teenager. You don't have it. Friend, there will be people that will say that to you. And here's what's really bad. They're not just with the enemy. Sometimes they're on your team. Sometimes they're over you. Sometimes they're your own family. But if you're going to take down giants, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. And you cannot be listening to, to the attacks of your friends, your families, or even your enemies. Verse 34, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he, he, when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard. Do you get that? He went and he got the lamb out of this, this, this animal's mouth. And then the animal came on him and he caught it by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Look at this. Seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord, do you see that? The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Do you get that? That was his key. That was his victory cry. That was his, his, his utter dependence. It wasn't on his staff. It wasn't on his rock, uh, his rod. It wasn't on his slingshot. It was the Lord. The Lord will deliver me out of the paw of the lion. He did it. Out of the bear, he did it. And he will do it from this Philistine. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Do you realize the bear that you're fighting right now, the lion you're fighting right now, is getting you ready for the giant of the future? If you don't stay and fight that lion and fight that bear, you're not going to be ready to fight that giant. The way you defeat the giant is the way you defeat the lion and the bear. Let God do it through you. So don't bail. Don't say, oh, I just don't like this bear. I'm going to run and get out of here. No, David. No, David. The, 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 the country of Israel is dependent upon you fighting that bear. You stay and fight. Number five, the conqueror. Now understand the conqueror is not the children of Israel. Understand the conqueror is not little David. The conqueror is the Lord. 
Goliath's speech. Verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Who were his gods? Obviously, he, 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 he believes in them. Well, Dagon was his god. It was a fish god. Belzebub was his fly god. He believed in his gods. The fly god. The fish god. What I find very amazing is a lot of us, we as Christians, with the living true God, we don't believe in him. Verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Do you get that? That's the key to the victory in your life. That's the key to defeating that giant. It's not you. It's not your stuff. It's you, not you finagling. Well, if I do this, I can figure it out. Let God slay the giant. He said and say, hey, I'm coming with all this artillery. I'm coming with all of this stuff. He said, I'm coming. In the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied, verse 46, this day will I deliver you? No, 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 no. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I'll smite thee, and I will take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know, listen to this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I love this. In the Old Testament, the name of the Lord represented the Lord's character. The name of the Lord represented the Lord's ability. The name of the Lord is everything that God is and everything that he can do. So when David comes up, the name of the Lord, he will deliver me from you and I'll take your head from you. He was saying, my God is powerful. Hold on a second. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. I don't know what your giant is, but I ask you to take your eyes off the giant and put them on the Lord. Verse 48, it came to pass, when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. I love this. Look, 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 look back up a, sec, a second. Look at verse 46. David is making his speech. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee. Look at the next phrase. And take thine head from thee. Hey, David! How are you going to take the old boy's head? All you got is a slingshot. You're going to wrap it around there and jerk it off? Hey, David, how are you going to take the old boy's head from him? Verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Hey, listen to me. Don't miss this teenager, college student. When you're in the will of God and you don't have what you need, God will provide what you need. Verse 51. Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword. Do you get that? If y'all weren't Baptists, y'all be shouting right now. He didn't have a sword, so he got the enemy's sword. He got the devil's sword, and he used the devil's sword for good. Well, glory. Pretty bad I got to amen my own sermons. 
and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, that's the last two words, they fled. Several years ago, Tracy and I, when we were in Pensacola, one of our church members went to the Holy Land. And the lady came back. I remember her walking up with a little bag, a little Ziploc bag. And she came up. She said, Pastor, we were in the Holy Land. It was just so wonderful and it was so outstanding. She said, we wanted to bring you something back. But we just couldn't figure out, what do we get the pastor? And I think it's a great idea. When you go on visits, you don't have to go to the Holy Land. Bring something back to the preacher. Banana pudding, whatever. Anything's good. She said, we thought about getting you some olive wood. We thought about getting, getting you and Miss Tracy some of that, that Dead Sea water and some of that, those mineral stuff. She said, but then we went to the Valley of Elah. She said, do you know what happened in the Valley of Elah? I said, oh, sister, I know what happened there. She said, Pastor, I brought you back some five stones from the Valley of Elah. She said, they weren't for sale, and I don't think I stole them, but I just picked them up and put them in my purse. <laughs> she said, Pastor, what I ask, and they were over there this morning, is that you take these stones and you put them somewhere in your office. And when those giants look too big and those giants look too bad and you think you're going to have to run, you can't face that giant. You just look at those stones and say, if a teenage red-headed boy could take down that giant, then God, do it again and take down the giant. Thank you for joining us today for Truth For Today. Our prayer is that God's Word has ministered to your deepest need and answered many of your questions about life. Truth For Today is only able to stay on the air through the financial support of God's people. Would you consider partnering with us to take the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world? You may mail your gifts to Truth For Today, P.O. Box 104, Bennett, North Carolina, 27208. Please include the call letters of this station when you write. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please request this sermon with your donation of any amount. If you would like to donate by credit card, you may call 336-581-3170. Be assured that God's Word has the answer for your every need. And join us next time for Truth For Today. The Daily Pursuit is Dr. Jackson's six-part sermon series on spiritual success from 1 Timothy. You'll be challenged, encouraged, motivated, and convicted to daily walk with the Lord in all your ways. For your gift of $50 or more, we'll send you this series, and you'll be partnering with us as we seek to tell the world of God's great love. So when you write or call, make sure you request the series, The Daily Pursuit, with your gift of $50 or more.